So let me introduce my speaker tonight, our speaker tonight. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we have Dr. Katerina Colaturu to speak for us tonight. She's a member of the board of the Classical Association in Northern Ireland. Um, Katerina grew up in Athens and she studied archaeology at the University of Athens. She came to the UK after that and did her PhD in Edinburgh on early Greek musical iconography. Um, so her current research, I beg your pardon, I'm still letting people in. Um, her current research is, uh, she's working on an excavation of the East House in Mycenae, which just sounds wonderful, sounds heavenly. Um, and she also researches on musical archeology. span so thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I'm going to hand over to you and Katerina is going to speak on the Oracle at Dodona, Soundscape and Religious Experience. Thank you very much, Helen. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Kani for inviting me to present and for hosting this event. And also to say that it's wonderful that we do have the opportunity to continue our communications despite the adverse circumstances. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Um, the sanctuary of Zeus Adodona in the region of Epirus in northwestern Greece is of special interest in the history of ancient Greek religion, as it was considered by the ancient Greeks to be the oldest Hellenic oracle. It was an oracle of great reverence, consecrated to the chief god of the Greek pantheon, Zeus, under the specific epithet Naos or Naios, together with his female counterpart, Dione Naia. It has been argued that the syncretism between the Paleo-European cult of Mother Earth and the Indo-European cult of Zeus was at home early on at Dodona. Despite its rather remote location, Dodona was a Panhellenic sanctuary open to all Greeks, and its uh, river oracle was paired in fame and reputation with the oracle of Apollo at Delphi. And literary evidence, excavated artifacts from all over the Greek world, and over 4,000 oracular inscriptions or lead tablets indicate Dodona's Panhellenic importance. But my talk today stems from my recent involvement in a collaborative project based at the University of Bristol and led by Professor Esther Adino. And this project aims to create a virtual reality experience of the ancient Greek oracle at Dodona, with the main objective to investigate the pilgrims' experiences in the context of historical oracular consultation. One exciting aspect of the virtual reality environment is that it affords the means to explore and experiment with the impact of the soundscape in the context of religious worship and to apply and test phenomenological and cognitive approaches in ways that are not otherwise possible insofar as historians and archaeologists cannot actually experience ancient, ancient religious activities in the way that anthropologists might. So, I think this is a very exciting prospect because it brings into the focus an integral but also intangible element of past societies, sound and sound perception and the effect that sound had on people. So I will review sources regarding the sonic environment of Dona that can hopefully help us understand how sound could have been instrumental in establishing performative interactions with the divine. And I will share some preliminary thoughts as research in this direction is still ongoing. But for this, we need to familiarize with the site of Dodona a little bit. So Dodona lies in the hinterland of Epirus, a mountainous region in northwestern Greece, stretching between the Pindus mountain to the east, the, the Pindus mountain raids to the east and the Ionian Sea to the west, Ambrachia to the south and Albania or ancient Illyria to the north.
Katarina, some sorry, something's happened with your microphone. It's got it's you've muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, where did you lose? Did you lose me? Just a few seconds ago. Right. Okay. Uh, from the Middle Bronze Age onwards, Epirus was inhabited by the Greek-speaking tribes that went on to settle in the rest of Greece and which mingled with the pre-existing pre-Greek in the European substratum that is referred in later Greek sources as the Pelasgians. The Thesprotians, the Chaonians, and the Molossians were among the most prominent Epirot tribes known in the historical period, with socioeconomic activities revolving around agriculture, sheep, and cattle herding. The Molossians became a leading power in the region in the 6th century, and from the 5th century on, the sanctuary of Dodona came under Molossian control, while in the 4th century, the Molossians established a coalition among the Epirot tribes known as the Epirot League. During the 4th century, the sanctuary of Dodona underwent an extensive building program as it had become the religious center of the Epirot League, and aspects of the cult featured emblematically on the coins, as the coins that you can see here um, with the, the, uh, the Zeus and the Dione on uh, one side and the uh, emblems of Zeus, such as the thunder, the tripod, and the um, Dione on the other. Whether Dodona emerged as a settlement or an opera sanctuary or on an oracle, it is uncertain. The site was first identified and excavated in the late 19th century by Costadinos Carapanos and is being excavated since the 1920s by the Archaeological Society of Athens and by the Ephorate of Antiquities of Ioannina. It is located on the south bank of a relatively low hill in the valley, outside the walled Acropolis at the top. The stone buildings that we see on the plan here were only constructed from the 4th century onwards as a result of the Dona's function as a religious and political center of the Epirot League. And they include a sacred zone to the east, comprising a twice enlarged sacred enclosure to Zeus. I'm trying to point out the edges. as well as the temples of Dione, Themis, Aphrodite, and Heracles. Then it includes a recreational zone, uh, including a theater and a stadium on the west, and an administrative zone with the Bulefirion and Titanium connecting the two zones. And the whole program is complete with a large courtyard with stores and a problem. The available archaeological evidence indicates human activity in the area from the later phase of the early Bronze Age. Literary sources also preserve, and to a great extent, rework collective memories from a very distant past for the existence of an oracular cult of Adorona, potentially in place even before the arrival of the Greeks in the Middle Bronze Age. The historian Strabo, who wrote at the end of the first century BC, relates in his geography that, according to early historians such as Ephorus, this oracle was founded by the Pelasgians, a pre-Greek indigenous of the Spartan, who were the earliest of all peoples who had held dominion in Greece. The antiquity of the cult of Zeus of Adona is hinted from the first time that the sanctuary is mentioned in the available sources, namely in the Homeric epics, which acquired the form in which we know them in the 8th century BC. In the Iliad, Achilles addresses a prayer to Zeus, the Lord Anax, invoking him under the epithets Dodoneus Pelasgicos. These epithets have been taken as an indication of the connection of the cult with the earliest inhabitants of the land already at the beginning of historic time. Herodotus mentions that the Pelasgians consulted the Oracle of Dodona, 
which was then the only oracle in existence. And the consultation was about introducing names for their gods from other peoples, to which the oracle considered. This reference carries a lot of weight, in my view, as it acknowledges a fluidity in religious conceptualizations and the importance of interaction precisely for defining the very nature and character of a distinct divinity. The Oracle of Dodona is very telling in this context as it offers evidence for a diverse, for diverse sonic pathways which enable communication with the divine. Now, zooming in on the natural environment of the ancient site of Dodona, we find it perched at the edge of an enclosed and somewhat circular valley at 650 meters above sea level, surrounded by three mountain peaks from the north, west, and southwest, with Mount Tomaros on the southwest being the most imposing at uh, 1,971 meters, and with the solid mountain edge of Pindus towering on the east. Although it appears to be tucked away, in the mountains, the small valley of Dodona is at the center of several natural passages formed, formed by the flowing rivers, such as Luros and Achelos, to the southwest. These natural corridors disrupt the steep mountain masses and offer quick outlets to the lowland coastal areas south and west, and also connect the area with Thessaly to the east, to the basin of Ioanni, and Macedonia, Nancy, and Illyria to the north and northwest. So Dodona might look remote on the map, but in reality it was pivotal for transhumans in both the prehistoric and the historic period, as well as for community networks and trade in Western Greece between local Epirot communities and Greek colonies in the Ionian and the Adriatic, between the Epirot hinterland and southern Italy and Sicily, as well as with North as well as with the north and the south via Anthrachia. Although it was indeed accessible, the journey into the valley could and most likely would have inspired intense feelings to a local or foreign visitor, finding oneself enveloped by the mountains as if in a protective cocoon that, is, that was also overpowering. In his 1962 treatise on Greek sacred architecture, Vincent Scully conveys precisely these impressions like a modern pilgrim. And I'm going to read the passage, and while I read it, I would like you to just get, lose yourselves in the picture that, and try to imagine you, you, are, um, you are walking along with Christine Scully. So he writes, before the pass, the great mass of Tomaros begins to rise up on the left. And the way to the Dona winds itself with vines under its planks. It passes first through a narrow, winding valley, which lies crushed under the outlying mass of the mountain. The massive rises up in splendidly bare and sweeping terraces to a towering ridge. The people's mind is stunned by the greatness of the landscape scale and by his own smallness. He's made to feel a power far grander than his own. And that power is entirely of the earth, enclosing him, restricting his freedom of movement, directing him with an insistent pressure. The way is narrow, but the whole curve of the passage leads him on. As he moves forward, the mountains begin at once to recede and to soar higher before, as in a beautiful rhythmic curve, before a long valley opens out before him. The terminus extends forward into the valley and its propylon is so calculated as to occur at the exact spot from which no further piece of any king can be seen beyond the tree itself. It is thus totally open under the sky and the release which began at the head of the valley is now complete. We should have no doubt that the character of the natural environment, the emotive nature of this particular landscape, and the interconnectedness that the Dona afforded to the local communities, both in the historic period and in the historical era, have equally played their part in the establishment and the shaping of the cult 
as well as its development and transformation over time. Scully's account literally conveys the visual impact of the landscape, but no human experience is complete without sound and the role that, this, that sound plays on human perception, processing of information, emotion, and affect is paramount. And let me briefly outline why this is. Our auditory system plays a major role in the way that we understand and interact with the world around us. Perceiving sounds informs us about the events, environments, and bodies in the world that produce sounds. Even when the ears cannot perceive the sound, the vibrations and motion are felt by our, by our own bodies. So sounds affect our whole body. And more importantly, our brains detect regularities in the temporal patterns of sounds and form predictions that influence our perceptions and actions. Therefore, sound events matter. And this is why the most compelling sound events of our environment the wind, rain, thunder, rusting leaves, rivers, seas, volcanoes, earthquakes, were all projected in the divine personas of the two major Greek gods, Zeus and Poseidon, who are both described in early Greek literature as deep crashing, varic peoples, loud roaring, eris pharaohs, and loud sounding, eric peoples. A phenomenological approach to the, Dodona, to, the, to, the, to the landscape of Dodona and to the soundscape of Dodona, substantiated with a breadth of scattered yet informative literary references, reveals the intense sonic impact of human interaction with the natural elements in the religious configurations of Dodona. Mountainous Dodona is described in the Homeric epics and elsewhere as wintry, with heavy winters. Rain and thunderstorms are common in the whole region, and the Dona was not an exception. It is in fact a likely scenario that isolated trees on the plateau could regularly attract lightning and doing a luminous character to the place. The gorges and corridors which make the Dona an ideal inter-local meeting place also resulted in torrents and gusts of wind, the latter filling the space with eerie sounds. Homeric formulae such as Zeus's wind, Zeus's lightning, lightning, Zeus's lightning bolt, and Zeus's rain, and Homeric epithets of Zeus such as Ipsivremetis, which means thundering on high, Erigdukos, which means strongly, strongly thundering, and Smerdalea Tupeum, terribly thundering, reflect the imprint of the sonorous weather phenomena on Zeus's divine character during the early Iron Age. In the 6th century BC, an iconographic type of Zeus hurling his thunderbolt makes its appearance, as you see on the two images to the left. Expressing the divine quality of this explosive sonority in visual terms, some of the earliest attestations of the iconographic type of Zeus Keravnios, Zeus of the thunderbolt, come from the Dome. But it may be possible to argue that the experience of an impactful sonic environment was intertwined with the nature of material dedications of the Dona since the Bronze Age. Among the prehistoric remains of the sanctuary are a group of early Bronze Age stone axes that were found near the cult area of the historic period, which seem not to have been used as tools, there's nowhere or there, but uh, were rather of symb symbolic character. A considerable part of the late Bronze Age finds from the sanctuary also comprises bronze axes of various Hellenic and Balkan types, as well as bronze weaponry. The dedicatory practice of bronze weapons and votive axes continues into the early Iron Age, also including thin, thin bronze axes, which would hardly have had the functional use. Both stone and bronze axes are polyvalent cutting tools used as weapons in war and hunting, and as sacrificial tools that are evidenced in Minoan and Mycenaean contexts, and are also understood as status or ceremonial symbols. Christos Kitsas, who studied the prehistoric bronze objects from the Dona, has tentatively hinted at 
a symbolic connection between the thunderbolt and the axe at the dome. Further support for such an interpretation can be found in Olya Zolotnikova's work, who has shown that the battle axe, together with the triple lightning, was emblematic for the Indo-European storm boat, storm boat from the second millennium onward in Anatolia. And she has also demonstrated analogies between the Homeric formula that I mentioned earlier and descriptions of the Syrophoenician storm gods such as Baal and El. Moving on to other sounds, sounds of water from the rain, but also of running water from the numerous local rivers and springs that we mentioned earlier, would have pervaded the countryside. Indeed, the mythological tradition recorded by the 5th century BC Athenian mythographer Perechidis, but probably going back to earlier times, connected with Pudona a group of nymphs referred to as rain nymphs, Hyades, and Dodonian nymphs, Dodonides. In the Latin tradition, they are designated as naiads, the nymphs of fountains, springs, and streams. According to some traditions, Diona, Zeus, uh, uh, Diona, the companion of Zeus, was also one of the Dodonian Hyad, uh, Hyades naiads. And worship of the nymphs is surmised by an oracular lamella that was dated in the 5th century BC, which contains the question about the proper season of sacrifice to a nymph. Latin authors from the 1st century BC and late Roman and Byzantine commentators also mention a sacred spring with magical water at the dome, which nevertheless has not been substantiated by excavation, neither is it mentioned in earlier sources. But the most emblematic Dodonian sound was that of the sacred oak or the beard tree, the tree that was the epicenter of the cult and the oracle. According to the ancient authors, the sanctuary was originally located in an oak grove and alces. Thus, we can imagine that the place was heaving with rustling sounds, fluttering sounds of birds and small animals, bird song, cicadas and woodpeckers in the summertime, and the coop and, and the cooing of frog pigeons that still frequent those craggy mountains. But usually, it is one oak that is singled out in the sources as a central sounding element of the sacred place and the source of the oracle. The oak is first mentioned in the Homeric epics in the Odyssey. As Odysseus relates to Evmeus that he went there to consult the oak regarding the safest mode of his homecoming. It is possible that in the remote past, one tree was set apart from the others in some way, thus marking the spot of the original cult. This must have been near the area where it has been identified an intact prehistoric burnt clay layer that was possibly a herd, along with handmade shirts and clay beads mixed with ashes and charcoal, and precisely where a modest naiskos the sacred house was built in the late 5th century BC. So, talking about this area here. The Naiskos was marked off by a small perivolos in the 4th century, whose offset entrance is thought to have been aligned with the position of the tree. The tree announced the will of Zeus. It is reasonable to think that the announcement was made through the natural rustling sounds of the leaves and the creaking of the branches, which were part of the natural soundscape, and which would then be interpreted by the priests or priestesses of the sanctuary. But interestingly enough, the majority of the sources referred to a communication with words. In Sophocles' Trachinia, for example, we hear that the oak told me 
such and such thing. Plato also refers to the word of the oath as the first prophetic utterances, connecting them with the remote times when people were content to hear the words of the oath, provided they were true. In a, in a few inscriptions on the lamellas from Dodona from the 5th and 4th centuries BC, it was asked whether a sign, Simeon, has appeared on the sacred oath. Parke observes that, Parke observes and other scholars agree that the implication of all this is that the will of Zeus was audible from the oath itself and it was not conveyed by the naturalistic sounds of the tree and their subsequent interpretation, as it is often hypothesized in modern literature. And in my view, this feature betrays early strata of animistic religions, that is, religions where natural elements were conceived as animal, and it has also been recognized as an element of the Minoan Mycenaean tricon. Regarding the nature of sound, we should note that although rustling leaves and creaking dances would have been very prominent at the embryons of the Dona, the process of communication with the god and the oracular consultation are tailored to the human sounding qualities and names. That, that, that means to the human voice, to the human speech to be precise. The local Dodonian legend recorded by Herodotus about the dog which once sat on an oak tree at the Donna and uttered in human voice a divine command to establish an oracle of Zeus under that oak, seems to have been invented by the 5th century BC in view of the fact that female priestesses, the Piliade or dogs, were associated with the sacred oak, but not from the beginning of the activity of the oracle, but in some later phase. And according to Plato and others, they were prophesizing in a state of trance. But in addition to the marvel of the talking tree, the Donna offered another most unusual sensorial experience, the Halkion of the Donna, also known as Asigitos Levis the never silenced cauldron. Our knowledge of it derives from several late antique lexicographers who describe it in relation to a proverbial saying that compares its sound with those that talk too much. The most complete account is that of Stephanus of Byzantium from the 6th century AD. And according to these accounts, the sanctuary of Zeus Adonna had no walls, but many tri tripods were placed closely together or side by side. And if one is touched, they all resound one after the other. This sort of description is repeated almost verbatim in late antique sources and is attributed to a certain Attic analyst, Demon, author of At Peace and some 40 books on Proverbs that he composed around 335 to 323 BC. In the Suda lexicon, it is mentioned that the cauldrons are placed in a circle and that one of them is struck, attributing the information to the aforementioned demon. And this reference has sparked hypothetical reconstructions of the cauldrons in a circular ar arrangement around the oak by the Greek excavator Dakaris and, is, and has been followed by others. Although the tree is never mentioned in relation to the Halkion. We can only assume that these tripods were set up as private or communal dedications to the sanctuary. Tripod cauldrons were the most prominent votive offering in Greek sanctuaries especially from the 8th century on, and the most elaborate ones. They were a wonder to behold, shining, voluminous, often decorated with human figures 
protoms of griffins and sirens, or in great mythical scenes. They were deposited at Panhellenic or interregional sanctuaries by important individuals as a sumptuous token of social status, wealth, prestige, and cleos. And because tripods were often given as prizes at competitions, and especially poetic competitions, Pope Alexander has argued convincingly that their dedication serves as a testament of high ability, achievement, as well as truth that was conferred by the gods. From the archaic period, the tripod was also seen as a token of territorial sovereignty. Therefore, tripods were set up as trophies commemorating communal victories. Often they were set up in groups. Hence, it is possible that resonating cauldrons like those attested by Dodona were perhaps occurring elsewhere as well, but perhaps not so prominently. Or sometimes they involved a figural group like the tripod dedicated by Gelon after the Battle of Chimera in 480 BC, that was also accompanied by the statue of Nike on a pillar. It was seen Oh, I have missed the page, I don't know. It would seem that the version of the Halkia of the Done finds some parallels in the context of communal types of dedications. Several fragments of tripod legs and handles dated between the 8th and 6th centuries BC have been found at the Donna. And better preserved tripod dedications have also survived from later periods. A second set of references offers a different description of a sound installation that comprises one bronze vessel struck by a bronze scourge with bone fittings. It is used like a beater that is set in motion by the wind. The sources that offer information on this version of the Dodoneum Halkion link it to another proverbial phrase, the scourge of the Corinthians. Strabo's passage that I have here on the slide is a good example of such descriptions. And I'm going to read it and you can read along. The temple, in, in the temple, was a copper vessel with the statue of a man situated above it and holding a copper scourge dedicated by the Papyrians. The scourge was threefold and wrapped and wrote in chain fashion with knuckle bones struck on it. And these bones, striking the copper vessel continuously when they were swung by the winds, would produce tones so long that anyone who measured the time from the beginning of the tone to the end, to count to 400. Hence, also the origin of the proverbial term, the scouts of the Cotillians. The, the single cauldron in this version of the Halkion sits more comfortably with the fact that the sound device na names the Doneon Halkion or Asigito Levis in the singular and not in the plural. Also, it can be connected with a specific communal dedication, the dedication by the Cochirians, who we know from the Lamele that consulted the oracle not only for personal but also for communal matters. For example, they had asked to which god or hero should they address their prayers for the best protection and security of the city. Bronze codes were dedicated at the Roma in the late classical period and later and you can see a couple of examples at the bottom of the slide. And several fragments have been record, recovered from the excavations. The association of the scores with discipline and pedagogy of the youths was proverbial for the city of Corcira. And it's also found in the Spartan initiation rituals at Artemis or Thea. The multivessel Halkion of the first description 
the sounds due to an acoustic phenomenon known as sympathetic resonance or sympathetic vibration, wherein a formerly passive vibratory body responds to external vibrations to which it has harmonic likeness. Cauldrons of the same material, same mass and same dimensions will vibrate at the same frequency. The phenomenon was known and experienced in other contexts as well. It is possible that it would have been experienced even in the domestic context, uh, when movable elements would rattle in the presence of a loud sound, such as a thunder, for example. And in his account of the siege of Ambracia, a city in Anatolia, by the Romans in the second century BC, Polybius describes how the Aetolians placed in line very thin bronze halbrons, which are in called halcomata, which were extraordinarily sensitive and vibrated to the sound outside via the sympathias, due to sympathetic vibration, so that they could hear by means of the sympathetic vibrations where exactly along the wall the enemy was trying to breach it by digging underground tunnels. Tripods of similar dimensions, mass, material, would reverberate in the same frequency. Tripods of different dimensions and mass would still resonate within certain parameters, but they would alter the sound. So the makeup of the line of tripods would affect the acoustic result. On top of the potentially discordant resonances, we have to add the harmonics of each lesson. The outcome will provide a rich acoustic experience, an interesting and an unpredictable sound, one that would not be tuned to a recognizable pitch, closer to what could be understood as an ethereal and non-man-made sound, but also not a musical sound either. The focus is always on the duration. The cauldron resonates for a long time, counting to 400 as Strabo, Strabo would have it for the second variation, which would mean around five or six minutes. Again, this is different from the notes voiced by instruments and from the human voice and speech, which represents steps between intervals with imperceptible, imperceptible silences between them. Nowhere is it mentioned that we are dealing with a loud or piercing or fear-inducing sound, which are common qualitative expressions when ancient authors refer to other bronze percussion instruments such as cymbals and even tympanum. To tolerate the long duration of the sound of the halkion, we have to assume that it was probably a medium or low frequency sound, that is, a medium or low pitch. Our sources are not conclusive as to whether the sound of the Halkian was oracular, and allusions to the sound leading to the mantic procession of the priestess date to the Byzantine era and should be handled with caution as they may, they may actually mirror the traditions about the oracle at Elfie. However, we should bear in mind that tripods were implicated in many foundation oracles and sovereignty stories in which they are connected not with the evocation of the prophecy, but with the fulfillment of the prophecy, which comes to fruition with the handling of the tripod. We can also safely assume that sounds did emanate from the tripods as, as and when they were handled in this context, but also in everyday life, perhaps ringing, bright, and somewhat prolonged, if good workmanship would permit it. And the sound would become an integral part of such performative experiences, either consciously or unconsciously. So, the Halkion provides a perfect example of what Safer described as a sound map, a prominent sound in the soundscape that is conspicuous, unique, full of symbolic power perhaps extraordinary or wondrous. These real auditory phenomena inspire the worshippers' fascination and awe, as well as a sense of involvement in a numinous moment. 
I would like to conclude this talk with some provisional remarks about the possible effect of the Halkion in the context of the oracle of the Dome. Archaeoacoustic research of various cult sites has shown that exposure to resonance frequencies found at various archaeological cult sites can affect the human body. More specifically, persistent exposure to low or medium frequencies of 70 to 140 hertz, that is frequencies similar to a deep drum sound, was shown to be responsible for brainwave frequencies that indicated a state of oniric experience with total consciousness, but without the use of chemical substances. Each individual is sensitive to different frequencies, so the experience is highly personal. Some people might have it, some people might not. The prolonged resonance of the Halkion would add its resonance frequency to the place, and it is possible that pilgrims in close proximity may have been affected by those frequencies in ways that could be described as an altered state of consciousness or deep meditation. In this way, it might have cancelled out the common experience of the sanctuary as a loud place, clashed with bodies, voices and noises, before entering the phase of molecular consultation. The sonic aspect of the sanctuary at Adonia also comes in contrast with the sensations of the thunderous place and the thunderous deity that we encountered earlier. Instead, we have an ambient sound set in motion by a combination of human and divine agency, which is the percussive outcome of the winds on one, on one hand and the most symbolically charged man-made artifact on the other, the triton. Here at Adona, we seem to have now an ambient sound that potentially could cancel out all else and help both the pilgrims and the consultants maintain focus and introspection and to tune in with the goal so that they benefit from his insightful guidance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Katerina.